Welcome back. We're talking about 1937, a really important year in computing. Claude Shannon has just finished and published that master's degree thesis I mentioned in the last lecture, in which he describes how you can use circuits filled with on-off switches to do math and even to do logical processes, what was called Boolean algebra, sort of thinking like if this and then this and then this and that, it means this. So it, these were circuits that could do logic. It was a hundred years after Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace had worked on their difference in analytical engines. And now finally, people were gonna get to build them because electric circuits would be the way to do the type of logic that they dreamed of. And in the year 1937, you have four people undertaking this great task. There's George Stibitz in the top left of that screen from Bell Labs, Howard Aiken of Harvard and also the US Navy, Conrad Zuse at the bottom left in Germany. Germany was preparing for war in 1937. And finally, at Iowa State University, there's John Vincent Adanassoff. Stibitz was really the first to get something done. He was a mathematician at Bell Labs. And you know, he's spending days doing calculations, trying to figure out how the phone system and networks could work better. And he wanted to have a device that could do the math for him. That's what drives all these people at first. And so Stibitz one day goes to the supply cabinet at Bell Labs one evening, and he takes home a few switches, some batteries. And when he gets home, puts it on the kitchen table and finds two tobacco tins and rigs up a device that's binary, has on off switches and little lights that go on and off. And he shows how it can do mathematical equations. And for that matter, any digital binary logical sequence. And he brings it back to his supervisors at Bell Labs and says, if you give me enough resources, I can make a really big one of these that will do the math we need. And so they do, and they create something called the complex number calculator because the Bell system needed to figure out how to use complex numbers as it was creating its uh, amplification of its signals. And in 1939, that gets built with 400 relay switches. And each one can flip on and off 20 times a second, which really speeded up the calculations Stibitz was doing. Likewise, Howard Aiken at Harvard, a physics professor, also wanted some machine that could help him do the complex mathematical calculations he had to do for his physics research. And he talks to the people in his department, and one of them says, hey, you ought to go look in the attic. I think there is a model of some machine, some calculating machine uh, up in the attic. And indeed, when he looks at it, it's a model of Charles Babbage's difference engine that Babbage's son had sent decades earlier to Harvard, and Harvard had just stuck it in the attic. So... Aiken pulls down some of the wheels from that. It becomes the inspiration for him to build what he calls Mark I, a computer that used mechanical switches. These weren't electromagnetic switches. They didn't click on and off nearly as fast as the one Stibitz was using from the phone company. It took him about uh, you know, six seconds to do enough clicks on and off to do a simple math problem, but still, it was a very large, much larger than the one Stibitz was building, mechanical switched electrical computer to do mathematics. Uh, Howard Aiken got called away to serve in the Navy in the middle of this process, and IBM was building the machine for Harvard. When Aiken came back to Harvard in 1944, just as the machine was getting finished, he was having a bit of a struggle with the deans of Harvard because he was so interested in practical things like building computers. They thought that it wasn't really academic enough, the research he was planning to do. So Aiken does something pretty smart. 
he tells the Navy, convinces the Navy that they should take control of this machine and they should base it at Harvard, but it should be a Navy operated machine based in the computer building at Harvard. And there is Aiken and he's commissioned as an officer in the Navy and everybody on his team at Harvard gets commissioned as Naval officers. So he can be the commander rather than have to report to the deans. You may notice one person in that picture, a little bit different from the others. That's Grace Hopper, a woman. We're gonna hear about her in a lecture coming up pretty soon. The thing that made uh, Howard Aiken's Harvard Mark I computer pretty cool was not the switches, because as I said, they were kind of uh, mechanical, done by motors, weren't all that fast. But what was pretty impressive was that you could enter programs, instruct the machine on how to do things by using tape. In other words, there was punch tape. He would do a whole reel of punch tape and the, the programs and the data would be entered into the Mark I machine by being fed in with this punched tape. So it could run for days with no uh, human intervention. Howard Aiken called it Babbage's dream come true. And finally, and there was, before we get to the purely electronic computers, there was Howard Zeus up in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, Howard Zeus was in charge of studying uh, aerodynamics for some of the fighter planes that they were building. And it took him a long time to do his linear equations uh, for uh, what he had to do in order to do the aerodynamics of these fighting uh, planes. And so he too wanted a machine that could help do the calculations for him. Uh, instead of using paper punch tape to enter it, you can see him there in the picture. He's using 35 millimeter movie film. Most of you don't remember what 35 millimeter movie film looked like but it was a long strip of film with little holes in the sides, sprockets, so that the projector could move it along. And he would punch holes in the middle of it there to be the binary on-off switch uh, instructions to put in programs and data. Uh, his very first model, the Z1, was completed in 1938. It wasn't very reliable. It got gunked up, didn't work all that well. Uh, and because he wasn't at Harvard or at Bell Labs, he was actually doing it in his apartment. He didn't have a lot of people to help him work with it. It was, though, pretty good in some other ways. It was electromechanical. It had switches from the phone company in Germany. And he wanted to make it even more electronic, to use these things called vacuum tubes. But the Germans didn't want to spend that much money. They thought they were going to win the war without it. And also, they mistakenly thought that it was more important to make weapons than it was to make computers. And so they sent Stibitz back to working on the fighter planes. And in 1943, when he, uh, he had a third version of his computer in his apartment, and it got destroyed by Allied bombs. So even though it was very close to being a programmable uh, computer that uh, had very fast switching capacity, it could have been called in some ways the first computer, but it never really got working and it got destroyed. And it didn't have much of an influence on future computers because it was in Germany and Germany lost the war. What Zeus had wanted to do was to use vacuum tubes, something that had been invented, you know, uh, perfected, you know, 40 years earlier to amplify signals. Uh, but uh, what they did was they could take a very low uh, voltage of electricity and put it through inside of a vacuum tube and regulate uh, a higher uh, voltage of electricity, amplify it, in other words. And also by the 1930s, uh, people like Tommy Flowers in England who were working with them realized that they could be made into on-off switches. Uh, if you ask your parents or grandparents, they remember radio tubes and vacuum tubes that were used in radios and TV sets. They look like incandescent light bulbs in some ways, and they glowed. And they were very important in the development of computers 
because unlike these click clacking electromagnetic or electromechanical switches that you needed to go on and off, they could do it a thousand times a second, be able to turn on and off a flow of electricity, thus to be able to do binary math or logic on off, on off, on off, maybe hundreds of times faster than the mechanical switches. The first person to use them was another loner, a guy named John Vincent Adanassau at Iowa State University. And he wanted to build, like everyone we've talked about, something that would handle complex math problems. And he decided to do it and to use vacuum tubes. The reason that's important is not simply because it's faster, but because when we think of a computer, we think it's electronic. It's not something that's mechanical. I mean, abacuses are computers, but they're mechanical from thousands of years ago. You know, they, you just sort of mechanically move things. With vacuum tubes, they could be made electronic. So he had all sorts of concepts of how you would store numbers using condensers or what we call capacitors that would hold a charge. He took, he took cans the size of like V8 juice, uh, canned juice cans, and they would spin around and hold the charges. But he also made a circuit using vacuum tubes. There you can see his sketches for it. And he did it sort of all in his own mind. He was somebody who just thought by himself, which was pretty good, except for when it came to building things. One day he was trying to figure out all the components of how you would store the numbers, how you would use the electronic tubes you can see there in the middle to do the processes. And he used to think by taking very long drives. He bought himself every other year a, a new Ford with a V8 engine. And he lived in Iowa, and in one night, he drove all the way to the Illinois border, uh, just thinking about how to build the computer. Um, it was also convenient to, fly, to go to the Illinois border, because in Iowa, there were no bars. You couldn't buy liquor by the drink in Iowa. It was a dry state. But right across the line in Illinois, there was a bar. And he ordered a couple of bourbon and Cokes, sat there on, alone, and sketched on a napkin how all of this would work. It was a single purpose computer, it was not programmable to do many things. It could just do the linear equations he wanted to solve. It had 300 vacuum tubes, uh, but he never fully got it working. Like Zeus, he didn't have a team around him. Uh, he, you know, when the punch cards and everything got gunked up, he couldn't figure out how to make the burners do the holes in them. So he didn't really have a team that was helping him. He gets drafted. This machine gets left in the basement of Iowa State University, and it gets completely dismantled. It would have been forgotten to history, probably, not considered one of the very first computers, but totally forgotten as something that had been abandoned in the basement in Iowa State, except for this guy on the left, a guy named John Markley. And John Markley made a fateful visit to the guy in the bottom right, John Vincent Adonassau, to go look at his machine. But that is the subject of the next lecture. Thanks.